All right, this is part two of chapter 8b and 9b on the appendicular skeleton of the upper limb, uh, including pectoral girdle and the articulations associated. All right, so we were last talking about the radius and ulna, um, the specific bone markings that are responsible for the articulation between those, uh, the two articulations between those two bones, um, or I should say the two synovial joints between those two bones. Uh, so we looked at the proximal and distal radio ulnar joints. One third joint that we wanted to that we should mention here is the interosseous membrane, um, which is the uh, a joint that is classified structurally based on the fact that we're looking at bone, dense regular connective tissue, and bone. So dense regular connective tissue is joining these two bones, and so we classify that structurally based on that uh, as a fibrous uh, syndesmosis, just like we did in the lower limb. And as such, there's a small degree of movement between those two bones at the interosseous membrane as a result because of supination and pronation. And so we refer to that joint functionally as an amphiarthrosis. All right, so there is our pronation and supination um, demonstrations. And then that takes us into the hand, starting with the carpals. Um, there are seven carpals that are shown here, the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum do form an articulation with the radius, the, the articular surface of the radius called the um, radiocarpal joint. There we go. And this is a joint that you can flex and extend. If you look at your wrist, you can flex and extend it. You can also abduct and adduct it. And as if you can flex, extend, abduct, and adduct, then you, if you're not looking at a saddle joint, then you're looking at a synovial condylar joint. Um, <clears throat> and as a, as a symphysis, we would classify it functionally as a diarthrosis. The other uh, joints that we can see are between the carpals, the intercarpal joints that you can see here. The other carpals are, um, well, we started with scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform. And then as we work our way back around towards the thumb, um, we have hamate, which has this prominent hook on it on the palmar surface, the capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. So these, this distal row and I believe I said there were seven carpals. There are actually eight carpals. But this distal row here uh, articulates with the metacarpals. All right. So then those are called carpometacarpal joints. And met carpometacarpal joints two through five are synovial planar joints, as are the intercarpal joints or synovial planar joints. Um, but this first one is unique, as we'll see. Um, the trapezium with the first metacarpal produces a saddle joint. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a minute here. The bones that are distal to the metacarpals are the phalanges, um, again numbered one, two, three, four, and five. This digit one is actually also referred to as the pollux. And so um, the pollux is composed of a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. And remember phalanx is the singular form of the word phalanges. All right, but if we're looking at digits two through five, then we're looking at uh, a proximal phalanx and now a middle phalanx and distal phalanx. The articulations between the phalanges are called interphalangeal joints. Oops, let's get there, interphalangeal joints. And um, at those joints, we have limited uh, mobility to just flexion and extension. All right, we'll move into, now this is uh, the articulations shown here, the, or the articular cartilage shown between the carpals, so forming those intercarpal, or sorry, yeah, that's right, intercarpal joints. And the radiocarpal joint, you can see, has a synovial uh, cavity here that is encompassing a space lined by the radius, the articular surface of the radius, the scaphoid, the lunate, and the triquetrum. The pisiform is excluded, and even the ulna is excluded from that um, synovial joint. So the ulna does not help make up the radiocarpal joint. Um, let's see. We can also see the planar joints here between the carpals and metacarpals, forming the carpometacarpal joints, except over here with metacarpal um, one. Um, we're looking at sort of those saddle-like surfaces. So this is another saddle joint. Synovial saddle joint was how we would be how we structurally classify the carpometacarpal joint of the of the pollux. 
So this is our diagram that shows us the various um, illustrations of the joints. The saddle joint here that we just talked about between the trapezium and the first metacarpal, that first carpometacarpal joint, um, allowing us to flex and extend the thumb to abduct and adduct, and then to oppose the thumb, which is where the thumb comes in contact with each individual finger. Um, so that, that opposition of the thumb is, is possible because of the saddle joint. Um, the the metacarpophalangeal joints are condyloid joints. We can, again, flex and extend and abduct and adduct those joints. So those are condyloid joints. And then the interphalangeal joints are ones that we can only flex and extend. So those are considered hinge joints. The hinge joints, remember, are uniaxial. The condyloid and the saddle joints are biaxial. <clears throat> and the planar joints are also uniaxial. All right, so then we move into injuries. So here are some injuries that we're going to discuss uh, associated with different joints that we've already talked about here, um, starting with the shoulder dislocation. And in shoulder dislocation, um, remember that the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, is supported by various tendons and ligaments all around from the superior aspect, the posterior aspect, the inferior aspect, but not as much here in the inferior aspect. So in a shoulder, in a shoulder dislocation, when a person uh, falls on or their arm or is hit when their heart arm is abducted, that's the position that it has to be in, um, then the, the head of the humerus moves out of the glenohumeral joint or that, that synovial joint there inferiorly because remember it's a little bit less supported there and as a result the humerus lies inferior moves inferior to the glenohumeral joint and the anterior muscles <clears throat> that are attached to the head or to the uh, pro to the proximal epiphysis will pull the head of the um, of the humerus anteriorly so that's a, sh a, a um, sort of a shift in the position of the head of the humerus which is referred to as uh, shoulder dislocation now, shoulder separation is when the acromioclavicular joint is um, affected up here, we can point to, where when a person um, falls on their shoulder joint, you know, directly on it, uh, so the shoulder joint is hit laterally, such as when you run into a wall or you fall on your shoulder on the ground. Um, so shoulder separation is, is that separation of that the acromioclavicular joint. Um, and it may, as I said earlier, involve tearing of this coracoclavicular ligaments, set of ligaments, which would involve some surgery to repair. That's a, a good stabilizer for this acromioclavicular joint, just to anchor it basically to the coracoid process of the, of the scapula. Now a, uh, a sublux radial head or a nursemaid's elbow occurs here at the elbow joint. And so what we're looking at is a lot of, you know, various ligaments that help support the joint, but we're going to concentrate on this annular ligament. And the annular ligament uh, forms a ring, you can see it here too, around the head of the radius. And before age five, um, it's not, this annular ligament is not fully formed. So if you're, you know, playing with a child who's under age five and, um, kind of swinging them around by holding their palms and swinging them out um, out into the air. Their forearm is pronated. And in that position, the head of the radius can slip out of the annular ligament, uh, resulting in some pain. And so they tend to hold their uh, forearm sort of slightly bent at an angle against their, their, their forearm, against their trunk, holding it in position. And they can't straighten their arm very well. So the, the way it's um, fixed at, at a pedi pediatrician's office, uh, in fact, is that they'll press on the posterior side of the radius and supinate the forearm. And it basically screws the head of the radius back into that annular ligament. Now a scaphoid fracture uh, results from landing on an outstretched hand when you fall. Um, and there's several things that can go wrong from that kind of way of catching yourself, but this is one of the things that can happen. And the scaphoid is actually located within this region uh, called the anatomical snuff box. When you slightly abduct the, the thumb, you can see this tendon um, emerge, and there's this space here called the anatomical snuff box. In that space is where the scaphoid is, and the radial artery crosses that region. So if the scaphoid 
gets fractured, then the radial artery can't supply that proximal region of the scaphoid uh, bone there. And so that can, if it's not doesn't heal properly, can lead to a vascular necrosis in that part of the scaphoid because of the limited vascular supply. And so that can lead to a degenerative joint disease in that, in that area. So this concludes uh, the discussion of chapters eight and nine re relative to the upper limb, um, with ending with several uh, injuries here that you can kind of take a closer look at. And we'll move on to the next recorded lecture shortly on chapter six, which is on bone and cartilage.